Coming up today, one man is thankful he had severe symptoms after a tick bite because that tick bite helped save his life, his path to a cancer diagnosis, and the newly approved therapies offering new hope. Good morning, I'm Jessica Lovell and welcome to the Morning Medical Update. There is no good time to be diagnosed with cancer, but thankfully many cancers are much more treatable today than they ever were 15, 10, even five years ago. When David Francais' multiple myeloma wouldn't stay in remission, doctors at the University of Kansas Cancer Center turned to a new form of immunotherapy, CAR T cell therapy a living drug using David's own immune cells. Today, we'll see what CAR-T has done for David and patients like him. But first, let's get to today's morning rounds. We are joined by pediatric critical care specialist, Dr. Sean Su, to talk about fall and winter vaccinations. Good morning, how are you? Good morning, thanks for having me, Jess. All right, lots of parents want to know when we gotta get those kids shot up. So there were headlines, though, as remember, back that the triple-demic back in 2022, the flu, RSV, and COVID. Um, how should we prepare kids for this fall, 2024? Yeah, we're entering that time where these viruses are more prevalent. So the best way to protect yourself and your family is get vaccinated, wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, and if uh, someone's sick around you, try to avoid them if possible. These viruses spread through coughing and sneezing. It can enter your mouth, your lungs, your eyes, your nose. So if somebody is coughing or sneezing around you, try to avoid them, but it can also be spread through surfaces as well. And so try to clean surfaces. It's hard to do, but if your kids are having a play date, try to clean those toys afterwards if possible, but uh, washing your hands is very key. All right, we could never be reminded enough of that apparently, so that's good to know. Talk about the sweet spot. When should we be getting our kids their flu shot? Yeah, right now is genuinely a great time to get the flu shot for you or your child. It takes about two weeks after that shot to develop that armor of antibodies before peak flu season really hits us. And so right now is a great time. I'll tell you last year the flu shot was efficacious. The flu shot does help prevent hospitalization and reduces the severity of symptoms. So I encourage all kids and adults to, to get the flu shot. Always are talking about the flu, but when is peak RSV season? Yeah, peak RSV season is really in the winter time, mid-December to February. And so we're already starting to see some cases now. It starts in the fall, peaks in the winter time, and ends in the spring. But uh, you know, I worked last night and we're already seeing a few cases of RSV trickle in. What are those symptoms? How do they differ from flu symptoms? Yeah, with kids in RSV, they usually have a little bit more rapid breathing. And so if you notice your child tugging while breathing in a low grade fever, it could be more RSV. With flu, you can have muscle aches, body aches, a higher fever and headache. But with RSV, you really look for that shallow, rapid breathing, seeing if they need more help with some supplemental oxygen to talk to your medical provider. Let's talk about kids with asthma. Any preventative steps we should be taking for those kiddos? Yeah, kids with asthma, you know, all these viruses we're talking about, flu, COVID, RSV, they can be triggers for an asthma attack. And in fact, asthmatics are more prone to pneumonia than non-asthmatics are. A leading cause of hospitalization and ICU care for asthmatics is pneumonia. So if your child has asthma, there's two things you can do. Number one is follow your written asthma action plan. And so if you notice that your child is having symptoms like shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, or chest tightness, follow that written asthma action plan and adjust medications as necessary. If you don't have a written asthma action plan, talk to your child's pediatrician to get one written up before uh, the peak RSV and flu season starts. The second thing is if your child has asthma and you think has developed flu or uh, really influenza, talk to your healthcare provider because there are certain antiviral medications you can give that will reduce the severity and symptoms of the flu. The reason why I say talk to your healthcare provider as soon as possible is because if you can start these antiviral medications between one to two days of symptom onset, it's really more efficacious. 
Are there any other new tools available to protect families against RSV? Yeah, so for RSV, there's a lot of new exciting developments. I work in the pediatric field, so I'll talk about my patients first. So if a child is still in the womb and mom is pregnant, mothers between 32 and 36 weeks of gestate of pregnancy can get the RSV vaccine. Mom will develop antibodies. Those antibodies will uh, transmit or transfer to the fetus. So the baby is protected while they're still in the womb and uh, when they're delivered. That protection lasts about six months. So one option is a pregnant mom to get vaccinated, usually around this time between September and January. The second option is the child just get the antibodies itself. That's immediate protection. It lasts about five months. Those are for all children under eight months of age, but also there are some high risk children that can get this antibody as well and it'll help protect them for the RSV season that's upcoming. Okay. And for adults, sorry, adults, uh, adults greater than 75 years of age can get the vaccine, but adults 60 and over with uh, certain risk factors like lung disease, heart disease, or immunocompromised are also eligible for an RSV vaccine as well. I want to sneak in one last yeah, quick sure. question. Is there ever a window that you can miss? Do you, is, can you go, uh, I guess, what's the window where you shouldn't get your kid vaccinated? Like yeah. past December, past January? Sure. Just say, forget it, just wait till next year. Yeah, really, this is the right time to get vaccinated now. But you're right, if it's springtime and your child is healthy, born on time, doesn't have any lung disease or any medical issues, it may not be worthwhile to get them vaccinated in May or June. You might as well wait if they develop, um, wait until the winter time to see if they need to be vaccinated or not. All right, always great to have you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Dr. Sood. Well, like many cancers of the blo blood and bone marrow, multiple myeloma has a habit of responding to treatment. That's the good news, but then it eventually comes back. David Francais lived with the disease for years before getting CAR T cell therapy, which is using his own immune system to fight his cancer. Here's Alexis Del Cid. David Francais lies comfortably in his hospital bed with the rhythmic clicking of a very important piece of medical equipment cycling beside him. He never could have imagined a tick bite in 2017 would lead to a diagnosis for cancer he had no idea was growing in his body. When I came back to Kansas City, I had pretty severe symptoms from the tick bite. So I get out of the hospital after getting treated for that and everything clears up. But David says the anemia detected during his time in the hospital was still worrisome to his doctor. He referred me into a cancer specialist and it turned out that they diagnosed me with multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma, cancer of the plasma cells in his bone marrow. Had I not had that tick bite, I wouldn't have known about it. At first, it was very scary. By 2018, he'd undergone a bone marrow transplant and was doing well. But four years later, David's numbers began trending in the wrong direction. It was time for something new. It's very exciting. We've been following the process of having it approved by FDA. We first caught up with David in 2022. CAR T therapy had just been approved by the FDA to treat multiple myeloma. This is not a hopeless condition anymore. On cell collection day, David with his wife Jerry at his side, watch as this machine removes infection fighting white blood cells or T cells from his blood. Next, David's T cells will be overnighted to scientists in a lab who will then multiply and modify them, adding a lab made cancer fighting gene to each cell. Can't wait for the T cells to come back and we start that journey. The couple is upbeat and optimistic, knowing that those cells will be infused back into David's body to act as mini soldiers trained to target and destroy those cancer cells trying to take over. The science of how they're doing it and the advances that medical people, it tells you why, why this community works so hard to get NCI designate cancer center because the value of that to having this kind of on the ground therapies, it just can't be overstated. And we are so glad to welcome David to our studio today. How are you? 
I'm doing great. You're doing great? You're feeling yeah. good? I feel good. I have a little cold, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm still a little immunocompromised but from the CAR-T, but uh, feeling great, uh, living my life. Well, I love to hear that. We love to hear that. We're uh, excited to hear about your story today. We are also joined this morning by hematologist and oncologist, Dr. Ala Ola Abdallah. He is the director of Plasma Cell Disorder Clinic here at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. And nationally, he is the chair of the U.S. Myeloma Innovations Research uh, collaborative. Always great to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're also joined this morning by Zara Mahmoud Jafari, a clinical pharmacy manager at the KU Cancer Center, and she has played really a pivotal role in building the CAR-T program for myeloma patients. Always good to see you. Always good to see you. Thanks for having me. So David, let's start with you. So you told us uh, when we spoke with you last that CAR-T therapy, it gave you hope. Uh, when you heard about it and you started. It's been two years since your treatment. Just how are you doing now from, you know, kind of think back before, uh, during, and now after? Well, I, first of all, I just completed my two year uh, uh, post-treatment post uh, uh, labs and, and exams. Um, uh, complete stringent remission is Dr. Abdallah's term, and I love hearing that. Um, I, my PET scan said no metabolically active multiple myeloma cells detected. Love that too. Um, as I tell anybody, I'll take a cold for the rest of my life to be cancer free, so. Absolutely, Dr. Abdallah, so what does remission then mean for um, the type of cancer that David had? You know, when we say remission, we know it's tricky, sometimes it comes back. Um, What's the status? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, first of all, the definition of multiple myeloma, like, you know, unfortunately, as you have mentioned, it's an incurable disease in the majority of the, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, treatments, you know, for myeloma. Um, however, you know, to reach remission, which is very uh, important, especially in uh, Mr. Francais' uh, situation, because he never actually achieved that, is to get the bone marrow biopsy clean of any plasma cells and the PET scan also clean of any diseases that's appearing there. So that's the deepest remission that ever, and that's why we call it stringent complete remission. To achieve it, that's really a big milestone. Why? Because it reflects that we can keep the patient in remission longer time. Of course, you know, we don't have strong evidence about how long uh, patients like uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Francais is going to stay in remission because we need longer follow-up. This CAR-T commercial just got approved like uh, a few years ago, so we are looking for longer follow-up in order to start identifying what is cure in these patients. So although we don't have that, and it's too premature to talk about it, but um, achieving this type of remission is really actually optimistic for us, you know, that we're hoping to keep him in this status for a long period of time. And David, in the video we saw you having your cells collected. Um, what's, what was it like just being a part of something this new, this innovative? Um, kind of were you taking it all in? What questions did you have? What were you thinking? Well, as, as Dr. Abdallah will tell you, I, I'm a very active patient. I love finding out about this. I, I had a lot of background in history with blood cancer before I ever was uh, was diagnosed with blood cancer. So I had great ass assets and uh, information and I was able to follow and I knew the CAR-T therapy that if I was going to get CAR-T, the one I wanted to have, I knew when it was FDA approved. I had read the clinical trial results. I was, you I was all stuff. in on it. So. <laughs> it's nice to have patients like that, isn't it, Doc? I know. It yeah. is. Um, so did you need chemo next? What was next? What was the next uh, process? I received, I received chemo immediately before the CAR-T infusion. Uh, I received the CAR-T infusion uh, August of uh, 2022, August 3rd to be exact. Um, and. Uh, uh, I, I was in isolation for then at the at the, uh, at KU at the hospital. I was in for uh, nine days, was dismissed. Uh, uh, ended up coming back that same day. I spiked a fever, and I was in for another six or seven days. Um, but after that, we were my wife and I were kind of isolated for thirty days, um, and. Uh, uh, but then it's been just a straight recovery. Um, so you kind of explained it, but compare it to perhaps like your previous cancer treatments that you had. What was the experience it, like? It was very similar in terms of not not the care, but the post treatment. I went home afterwards. I was in uh, I was in uh, ice, basically house isolation for a period of time, and then very limited. Uh, uh, number of guests and people we could have around and then after 
uh, 90 days, I went back and, and, and actually with CAR-T it was a little shorter than that. It was about 60 days. I was allowed to just uh, resume all the activities in my life. But you said you're back to living. Absolutely. So, Dr. Abdallah, let's back up. Let's define multiple myeloma. Uh, how do you explain it to a patient? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the first thing I always try to kind of be very clear with the patients about what is multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is a blood cancer. Um, unfortunately, in our uh, immune system, which is the white blood cells, we have part of it, like the plasma cells, that produce antibodies to fight infection. Uh, some of it for some reason, we don't know, is it genetics, is it uh, exposure to chemicals, uh, pesticides, radiation therapy, there's still unknown what kind of provoke these plasma cells to start producing defective antibodies. Uh, these defective antibodies initially, they're a small amount, they don't cause any problems, very benign disease, but by years they become more aggressive, they start causing damages, and that's where it defines myeloma. So it damages things like the bone marrow, so patients will, uh, like Mr. Francais, he's, will have anemia, he will become weak, you know, uh, because it dam damages the bone marrow, and also it can damage the bone itself, causes bone pain, fractures, it can damage the kidney and cause kidney damages, and also can cause infection because it can get overwhelmed. So really, actually, it's your own plasma cells, your own immune system that's supposed to protect you that get defective and start producing these weird number of highly defective antibodies to cause damages in your body. Was Historically, has it been pretty tough to treat? Yes, it has been in the 80s, 90s, you know, very difficult to treat, you know, and we had to tell patients, like, you have maybe between six months up to two years to live until newer drugs have been evolved, and I think the biggest uh, time breakthrough that we have was 1999. Thalidomide was invented, it discovered as an anti-myeloma treatment, and the reason about how impressive that was, is was the first type of immunotherapy uh, treatment for myeloma, and it worked very good. And after that, we have start seeing a, a shift of the survival rate. Patients are living longer, and they have better quality of life since that time. So we're talking about like from telling patient you have six months to two years up now without including CAR T cell in the newer treatment, you have 15 years to live. So we're hoping that CAR T is gonna add more in the future, but this is really how we are telling patients that we're really living in a, an era that we have really multiple options of therapies. I thought that's a, those are good conversations to have, yeah, right? absolutely. Um, so we explained what CAR-T therapy is, taking someone's uh, immune cells, genetically engineering them to then go back in and fight the cancer. Just put into context what a big deal that is, this immunotherapy uh, for patients like David. Well, I mean, first of all, um, we look at a lot of things. One of the major things we look is, is this treatment effective in uh, uh, Mr. Francais' uh, stage. As we say, like when you get a lot of treatments, uh, at this stage, it's you're lucky if you keep the disease stable or have some response. To get complete response, you know, that's really impressive, you know. So what CAR-T has shown us that, yeah, after all these treatments, <coughs> you still can get a complete response. So that's one thing. Number two is this is the only treatment that we give it only one time. Every myeloma patient, and Mr. Francais can tell you that he have to he have to come to the clinic every week, or have to be on a pill. You're getting a treatment only one time. And the first question patients are asking me after the CAR T, what treatment I need to take? You know, I say, no, you don't need to take anything. You don't need to take any pills. You don't need to come every week for an IV injection or uh, or IV chemotherapy or an injection. So the good thing about that is the quality of life and effectiveness and quality of life that actually be provided for all myeloma patients. So that's really how important this is for myeloma patients. And how soon after do you know that it's been effective and it worked? Well, I have seen that it, effectiveness actually starts after one week to two weeks, but you know, officially, like I'll say one month, that will confirm that. So does the word cure apply when talking about CAR-T therapy? Again, I think it's very difficult. Like this have been approved in earlier relapse like a few months ago. I think we're gonna take us years and years to know about it. I'm hoping that we're gonna see patients who have that cure rate high and we will start, you know, uh, acknowledging the percentage of patients that uh, either the CAR-T can cure myeloma. So had uh, CAR-T been FDA approved at the time that David underwent his bone marrow transplant, uh, would that CAR-T then be your first line of defense back then? Um, it's very difficult to beat transplant. Transplant has been there since 1983. Um, absolutely not, nothing has been in transplant so far, head to head, uh, old and new chemotherapies. There is a clinical trial ongoing right now between CAR-T versus transplant. 
Uh, the good news is that for a lot of patients for transplant, like patients can stay in remission for at least eight years now with the newer treatments. So CAR T had to beat that time, you know, in order to become first line of therapy. Uh, so I think it will know about that, but it's going to take us years and years to know if CAR T is as effective as stem cell transplant and to replace uh, uh, stem cell transplant in the future. And the University of Kansas Health System, one of the first sites in the world to offer CAR-T immunotherapy. What was the process like to get it here? Well, I mean, I think this question is really appropriate for Dr. Mahmoud Jaffer, but I would say that both Dr. Mahmoud Jaffer and Dr. McGurk, you know, really played a big role to bring the CAR-T, not only for the myeloma. Uh, the initial CAR-T was for acute leukemia and also for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. They actually, with the KU Health System, you know, with all the resources that was developed there, they built really a complex and a comprehensive infrastructure for bringing the CAR-T cell, and that really helped us a lot, not only getting clinical trials, but also to build the infrastructure for commercial CAR-T in myeloma. Zara, you're a pharmacist with the Cancer Center. When people think of cancer drugs, they automatically think of oftentimes chemotherapy. How is this different? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, you know, I think both both David and Dr. Abdullah kind of highlighted that in the earlier segments related to chemotherapy. As a standard, classically, chemotherapy works on all types of cells, including cancer cells as well as normal cells. And so the challenges that we face with cancer, uh, chemotherapy rather, with, with chemotherapy is the fact that these patients often experience you know, more widespread side effects such as nausea, vomiting, hair loss, so it affects normal healthy cells. Um, the other challenge with traditional chemotherapy is the fact that patients have to either uh, taking the medication by mouth or intravenously have to probably take the ther therapy either indefinitely or for multiple cycles. And so that can be really challenging for patients and come at a significant cost as well. And then as Dr. Abdullah mentioned, CAR-T is a one-time infusion. It harnesses the patient's own immune cells and so it can be a lot more specific to the patient's disease. And so it's definitely um, another tool in the toolkit and something that um, we are learning a lot more about and have learned a lot about in the time that it's been available. So it's been a really exciting time. So the cells are sent to a lab. Where is that lab? Uh, who operates it? Yeah, so as of right now for the uh, FDA approved CAR T cell therapies. The lab is located within the manufacturing facility of the pharmaceutical company. Now in clinical trials, there is a lot of work being done to see if we can make this process faster. The labs are located um, on opposite coasts at this point. It really depends on the pharmaceutical manufacturer. There um, also are some products that are looking to be approved um, here soon that are in Europe. So that will be interesting from a logistical standpoint moving forward. Um, but you know, the process really does, in the video you saw with, with, Dr. with Mr. Franze, is the process really starts here and then is a, a really complicated workflow of getting the cells here making sure they're shipped appropriately to the respective lab for manufacturing, and then a really very rigorous um, process from the manufacturers to ensure that it makes it back to us in a safe manner so that we can infuse it back to a patient. So the labs are at this point located on opposite coasts. Again, depends on the manufacturer, uh, but uh, hopefully will be far more efficient in the future. A lot of coordinating. Lots of coordination. Sounds like. Uh, be sure to ask your questions. You can use the chat on YouTube or Facebook. You can email the Medical News Network. Information is right there on your screen. Uh, David, um, even before your diagnosis, you were involved with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Um, you've seen how tough blood cancers can be, as you had mentioned earlier in our conversation. Can you tell us about your nephew? Um, yeah, my nephew, who's my godson, uh, he was diagnosed with leukemia when he was four years old, 1980. He died in 1984, um, eight years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me a number of years to, to get past that, but I ultimately decided, with support from my brother, um, we decided to become involved with Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So I became a local volunteer. Um, I uh, uh, raised money here locally. Oh, don't uh, be shy, tell us how much you've raised. Tell us about all the work you've done, because it's been a lot. Well, I, I was, you know, I'm humbled by it. I was uh, elected to a member of the national board, ultimately, of Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And about 15 years ago, I had the privilege of serving as the national board chairman for two years. And, you know, I just have to say, whether you call it karma or divine providence, at the time I did that, I had no blood cancers. I had no engagement. and. You know, I'm just blessed that the support I was able to do, and we raised a lot of money. The first year I was uh, 
national chair was the first year we had over $300 million in revenues for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And, um, you know, it's still a great program and funds great research. Well, so. we need to keep you around a long time, making a lot of money and doing a lot of good stuff, right, Doc? Absolutely. Um, so gene editing, we know that comes with a ethical and a safety um, obligation. Um, how do we know that these edits are only treating uh, the disease and not causing other unintended effects? And how do you answer those questions when those come up? I think this is a very important question, you know, and we know that uh, this has been raised as a, as a black box, you know, about like a secondary cancers, uh, lymphomas, leukemias, and uh, other types of cancer like MDS uh, for myeloma. But we have to understand a couple things. What is the rate of that? Percentage of uh, patients who get CAR T cell, and like I think they did a really great big study for all CAR T, myeloma, lymphoma, and leukemia, and found out like it's around 4%. Um, they found out that, you know, um, it, that is the percentage of patients who actually can develop a secondary cancer. But in multiple myeloma, we have to understand, unfortunately, it's an incurable disease. You know, if you actually look at the benefit and risk, you know, every single drug in myeloma can also have the same, uh, you know, um, toxicity that can be also deadly, um, you know, and uh, including like, you know, some of them can cause secondary cancer like transplant and revlimid. We have to understand that the benefit of the CAR-T also outweighed the risk, you know. Um, we always address the fear for patients, like if they are worried about the secondary cancer, but we also have to understand there is an active cancer called myeloma. Uh, myeloma is still, unfortunately, the first common cause of death for myeloma patients. So getting the CAR T cell makes a lot of sense in terms of like the benefit outweighed the risk. We've got some great questions coming in from our viewers, so I want to get to those. And Yen has a question. Could you please explain the difference between bone marrow transplantation and CAR T cell therapy and which one is more effective? You kind of touched on this. For patients undergoing CAR T therapy, couldn't they simply receive a bone marrow transplant instead? Why do we need this new therapy if bone marrow transplantation already exists. Okay, great. Uh, so first of all, the difference between bone marrow transplant and CAR-T is way different. Mm -hmm. uh, bone marrow transplant really, it's like a, a chemotherapy called melphalan. It's just like, you can call it like, a, I, I really describe it to patients like a nuclear bomb. You throw it to the bone marrow, you kill every myeloma cell there. The transplant here is that we take your stem cells before we throw that, you know, in order to save it in a bag in a fridge. And after we throw that nuclear bomb, we destroy everything, the cancer cells, the good cells. It will take months and months for you to recover by yourself. So instead of taking months for recovery, we take your stem cells back and infuse it back to your body and save that 10 days. Now, what transplant is going to do here, it will keep you in remission longer time. That's something here. CAR T cell, in other hands, is taking your T cells, regardless of your bone marrow status, engineer it, and infuse it back to your body to attack the myeloma cells. Now, a lot of patients ask us, well, if transplant is working, why should I worry about CAR T cell? That's a great question. Well, the problem here is that, as we talked about it, 85% of myeloma patients newly diagnosed, and this is by all evidence, unfortunately, it will relapse. So we have to kind of acknowledge the fact that we need some treatments. That's why we have uh, many classes of therapies, at least five good classes of therapies for myeloma. So the more we have classes, the better we are. We're not yet into that situation that we say we cure myeloma. Uh, so yeah, transplant is an effective treatment. However, it's not a curable uh, treatment. Okay, Rob said, he goes, I heard PET scan. Is there a difference difference for CAT scan and PET scans? Can you explain? So PET scan is kind of like, well, I, you know, we use it like CT scans. Um, identify if there is any uh, damages in the bones, you know, and a PET scan will tell you if there is any activity of the cancers in these damages. The reason I like to use these PET scans, when I treat the patients, and after I treat, I want to see if it's effective. If I do the CT scan before the treatment <coughs> and after, uh, that lesion or that destruction is going to still be th there, so I will not know if I got rid of it or not. But when I do the PET scan, there is an activity before the treatment and activity after the treatment. So when I see the activity dropping down, that means I'm killing the cancer cells. So I kind of use that to kind of like give me an evaluation. Did I get rid of the activity and the cancers itself by the PET CT scan? Yen also wants to know, could CAR T cell therapy lead to autoimmune diseases? 
Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know exactly if there's any studies have been proven that, you know, have... We haven't seen that necessarily. I will turn the tables, though, and say that there's active research being done for cell therapies in the autoimmune space, and so we anticipate those trials um, and are actively doing those trials here. So I don't think that we have enough evidence to suggest that they cause autoimmune disorders. Uh, we are still learning about the long-term side effects related to CAR T cell therapies. Um, however, like I said, we have clinical trials here for the treatment of autoimmune disorders, and we're looking forward to seeing how those pan out. Marsha wants to know, David mentioned earlier that he is immunocompromised. Can Dr. Abdallah elaborate on that and why? Oh, so um, one of the negativities of most of myeloma treatments, including the newer treatment, the CAR-T and the bispecific, is uh, causing the immune system to drop down, especially the immunoglobulins, which fights your infection regularly. So when he say he's immune compromised most of the time, is there is a level of the IgG that's always dropped down. And uh, what we do is that we give him some medications like the IVIG to boost it up, you know. So that's one of the um, side effects that, you know, patients have with CAR-T cell and other newer treatment like the bispecific that we're using their own immune system to attack the myeloma cells. Debbie says, she says, I have MGUS. What is that, by the uh, way? That's the one I was talking about, the monoclonal gammopathy. Okay. Yeah. So she has MGUS and M proteins in her blood. She wants to know, can this therapy be used before the condition turns into myeloma? Well, I, I don't advise that. And there is a reason for that. For these patients to transfer to myeloma, um, it, you know, in 20 years, it's about 20% of these patients. 80% will have this uh, MGUS, which is asymptomatic, staying asymptomatic. If you give CAR T cell just to drop the counts down, unfortunately, I will think that the, you know, as uh, Mr. Francais say, you're you're having some cold, you're having some rate of infection, you're just not, you're just treating a number, you're causing more side effects for that reason. So I do not recommend, you know, using CAR T cell in this stage. Jeremy wants to know, can chemo? go after the modified T cells as they reproduce in the body the same way they go after hair and other fast growing cells? Or do they reproduce in a way that chemo doesn't interfere with it? So they work completely differently. So CAR T cells are genetically modified to recognize specific receptors on the, the cancer cell itself. So they don't actually impact normal cells, which is why we don't typically see the side effects of chemotherapy like hair loss um, and some of the significant impacts on the patient's immune system. Um, they do have nuanced adverse events though, so we do monitor for side effects like cytokine release syndrome that we typically see in those first 10 to 14 days after CAR T cell therapy. There also is um, a chance for patients to be a little more confused and have a little bit more neurotoxicity um, is what we call it. So there isn't uh, necessarily the same concern of those all-encompassing side effects that we see with chemotherapy with CAR-T, but they do have some nuanced side effects that we have to be aware of, train for, and, and manage. Let's stick with you. From your perspective, what's the biggest takeaway today? Uh, well, the biggest takeaway for me is that uh, we are allowing our patients to live uh, really healthy, fruitful lives. They can continue to advocate on behalf of themselves and, and other patients. Um, it's really always a privilege to, to see the work um, in, come to fruition. It's an exciting time. Uh, KU continues to be at the forefront of this research and, and we're really proud to have it um, be available here in the state of Kansas and, and more broadly to the general region. So it's a really exciting time and innovative time. So really happy to be part of it. David, so glad to have you sitting here at the desk with us today doing well and uh, able to go on and continue to do the great work that you do in our community and beyond. What's the big takeaway from your story? Well, I think, I think there's two part. One, as I said on that video, there is hope now. We have, we have dramatically turned the tables on multiple myeloma. No, it's not curable, but we have really made a dent in it. Let's put it that way. The other thing is I think it reemphasizes the need for having our comprehensive cancer center here. Um, I didn't have to go anywhere. I was able to stay in my community and receive the most advanced treatment in the world. And that's remarkable. Awesome. Hard to follow that. What, what's the big takeaway? Well, Dr. the Bella? big takeaway, I also you know, want to advise a lot of patients. You know, you're, you're going to read a lot of things in the internet, especially mm -hmm. you know, about car key cell, about the side effects, and you might get some um, you know, negative feedbacks from, um, you know, some people who have like, you know, maybe 
um, questions about bad outcomes. My biggest advice for these patients is always try to seek um, a second opinion from the expert. In KU, we really, as a plasma cell disorder director, we have many specialists in myeloma and CAR-T, and we're happy always to answer these questions, you know, in order to make sure that all questions are answered instead of like, you know, reading some testimonies that might be misleading, you know, in that case, you know. So we're always happy to, uh, you know, discuss these cases, you know, for consultation in order to kind of make sure that patients are making the right decisions in that regard. Great to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank to all of our guests and to our viewers for being with us. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update. Menopause shouldn't be a mystery, but even doctors say they have a lot to learn. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Morning Medical Update. Best-selling author Dr. Mary Claire Haver shares the insights from her latest book and joins expert physicians to unpack the challenges, triumphs, and critical health advice every woman needs. Monday at 8. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stein's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.